it's time to roll here. Uh, we have a good sized audience with us. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Heather Sabin. I'm here from Monona Terrace Community and Convention Center in Madison, Wisconsin. We are having a banner weather day of 67 degrees and we're enjoying that. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you. If you've been with us for previous lectures, welcome back. And if you're joining us for the first time, we're really glad that you discovered us and you're with us today for this great lecture. We're pleased to announce that this is one of several lectures this spring we are presenting with sponsorship by American Institute of Architects, Wisconsin. This organization has been a valued partner for us at Monona Terrace for many years, and we're so glad that we could continue this virtually. Uh, we do have two more scheduled for the rest of spring, and we'll announce those dates soon. We'd like to remind the audience to use the Q&A button today to communicate with us. We don't use chat for this program, so feel free to communicate, whether that's a comment or a question. And our speaker has graciously agreed to take questions after his presentation. So please go ahead and type those in. This program is being recorded. So bear in mind that if you must leave early, uh, you can find it later at MinonaTerrace.com slash webinars. And you'll find a right design series library where you can locate this recording. And now you'll see an additional face on the screen here. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jacob Morrison, who is representing American Institute of Architects, Wisconsin today. Jacob is a licensed architect and lead certified, certified professional. He holds a master's of architecture degree from the Savannah College of Art and Design. And he's worked for several award-winning films, including Hardy Holtzman Pfeiffer Associates and Robert A.M. Stern Architects. Before moving to Madison, he has found his own firm here with his partner, Matthew Tills. And Jacob, thanks for being with us today. I toss it to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, in turn, am very uh, pleased and, and proud to present our speaker today, Thomas Morbitzer. Tom is a founding partner of Amore Architecture along with his partner, Goyal Amore Vivant. Um, they specialize in custom residential projects and bespoke office spaces. They have emerged as experts in areas ranging from building systems to furniture designs. Their work has been described as being sensitive, thoughtful, unique, unexpected, bright, and colorful. And I would add to that playful and clever, and clever in the sense that it's always incredibly smart. Um, Thomas and Goyle met as graduate students at Yale and worked together at Robert A. M. Stern Architects before starting their own practice together in 2007. And in addition to architecture, while at Yale, Tom studied uh, material artifacts of American houses and furniture in parallel with their social and historical aspects. And from 2006 to 2015, Tom also taught at Parsons New School for Design and New York School of Interior Design and has continued to be a guest critic at design schools. Amor Architecture's designs for decorative objects such as furnishings and rugs have been widely published along with their architecture projects as well. Interior Design, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and they're really just amazing projects. And I'm really glad to have a chance to get some in-depth looks at them with, with Tom and Goyle's help. So without further ado, Thomas Morbitzer, More Architecture. Hi. Hi, everybody. Greetings from New York. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Heather, for having us. Um, we're excited to be here. Uh, it's not lost on me that the Previous lecture that you had was the rural studio, which uh, the amazing work, uh, always impressive. And uh, we're gonna be the exact opposite, I think today from the rural to the urban. So <clears throat> I'm joining you today from uh, New York City. Let's see if the, uh, I'm not getting the slides advanced. There we go, here we are from New York City. So. Uh, this is where we are. Our office is here. I'm on the eighth floor. So if you hear a siren or a horn or even somebody yelling, even though on the eighth floor, uh, you'll know where it's coming from. It's, this is 23rd Street here going from upper left to bottom right. And then we have Broadway coming across here. Uh, this is the famous Flatiron Building uh, and uh, Madison Park uh, here is the nice green spot in the middle. So. Uh, like I said, we're presenting our work from Amore Architecture. Uh, we're a small team. We fluctuate between six and eight people. Uh, one unique thing about us is that we're architecture and interior design. Um, 
and we do projects across the United States uh, internationally. We've uh, had clients take us along with them to Israel and Jordan. Uh, so it's fun, you know, from, for a guy from Ohio, it's, it's really exciting to be sitting in this office and uh, running a firm and, and participating in kind of the, the life of the city. Uh, this is a picture of Madison Park uh, from a different angle uh, between 1909 and 1926. Um, I am not this old, but um, it's interesting because a lot of the buildings that we end up working in are, you know, 100 years old or more. So there's, there's some uh, parallel here. Like Jacob said, I'm a Buckeye. I grew up in Columbus and I went to the Ohio State University for my undergraduate work. I had fantastic teachers there and a really powerful experience. Um, I interned at the Columbus Neighborhood Design Assistance Center, uh, redesigning storefronts and urban corridors and stalls for vendors in local food market. Um, I went to Yale for graduate school where I met my partner Goyle and we graduated in 2000 and started working at Robert A.M. Stern's uh, office. Uh, and that's where we met Jacob. Um, like he said, we taught at Parsons uh, New School for Design in the AAS program and at the New York School of Interior Design. And just a fun little fact, I like to do watercolors, uh, oftentimes sitting in this very park. <laughs> so uh, it's a great image. Uh, this is the old Madison's uh, garden uh, that was designed by Stanford White. And this uh, New York Life building on the left, this tower that was modeled after uh, the Campanile San Marco in Venice. And that's how we know this photo is between 1909 when the tower was built and 1926 when the, the old gardens was destroyed. <clears throat> so this is us. We'd love to have some uh, extra follows on our Instagram after this. Shameless plug, can't help it, it's too fun. But this is my partner Goyle, who's an amazing talent and falls into the, the very first thing I have to do is thank you. Uh, first of all, I have to thank our clients. Um, they're just exceptional people and they, they trust us, which is a big deal. And uh, I think that trust is shown by uh, the amount of repeat clients we have and that our work almost only comes from referrals and personal introductions at this point. Um, that's a really big deal for us. Uh, the other thing is we have to thank our builders. Uh, they are incredibly caring and, and careful people who trust our vision and understand the high standards we have for our clients. Uh, we work with absolutely the best consultants, uh, engineers, lighting designers, our photographers, whose work you'll see today. And then the talent we have in our office. I mean, of course, Goyle, I owe so much to him and everything I learn every day uh, by working and living with the same person, as well as the crew we have in the studio. Um, they are so incredibly sharp and they're organized and they solve problems and they dream up things that don't even exist. And then after dreaming up, uh, they make it happen. So I have to thank all of these folks for contributing to uh, our presence today. So our talk is gonna focus on our New York City work. Um, I've called it generically small spaces, big ideas, um, but the subtitle, the alternate title is building submarines in the sky. Um, and that came from a discussion I had with one of my friends and we were talking about building a big house uh, and building a big house is like building a battleship. Um, all the resources and space are there. When you build a small house, um, you're building a submarine. Like every little inch matters, every uh, section uh, has some impact. And then when you're doing an apartment in New York City on the 30th floor, it's like you're building a submarine in the sky. So I'm going to start today with an overview of our office. Uh, we have quite a diverse amount of project types. Uh, we do commercial projects, residential, and houses and apartments. This pr presentation is gonna go into depth, um, to great depth, I think, <laughs> on our residential apartment projects in New York City, specifically. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two different common types of residential buildings uh, in New York. Um, the project is often defined by the constraints of the site, and that ties back to the construction type, whether it's a slab or an ash fill or a mill type loft building. Um, and then, you know, we understand the, the limits and the uh, opportunities present in each type. So I'll go into a little bit of detail about the difference between working a slab style apartment versus a pre-war ash fill type thing. So residential projects in the world of architecture and the world of architecture that builds skyscrapers and bridges and, you know, everything else, Residential projects are typically small in scale in that context. Within residential design, apartments are even smaller and more incredibly detailed, uh, which is where for us and our firm, architecture and interior design overlap and become 
uh, something unique and something special and something fun. So the quick overview for our office, uh, you know, like I said, we do commercial offices, we do residential projects, not in New York City, but we do a mix of modern and traditional projects. Um, we treat design as problem solving with style. So we're not just recladding or restyling something that is already there. We're actually trying to solve a problem and often trying to create a home for 21st century family out of something that was built in the 20th century, early 20th century or earlier becomes that problem that we're solving for. So just a quick snapshot of some of our commercial spaces. You've got some handsome models there that we uh, put ourselves in the photo. This is a, an office space we did um, right before the pandemic closed everything. Um, and it, you know, it was taking like a very generic kind of cubicle farm and making something special, something vibrant, something that added to the brand. You know, the workplace is evolving. It has been evolving for a while. The pandemic really acceler accelerated those changes and uh, we're ha happy to uh, help reimagine the next iterations. I think the next phase workspaces will have to work really hard to attract talent and build cultures and to, to get butts back in seats, to be honest. I mean, it's really, I think the next wave of what we're gonna have to tackle there. Um, we also had the really delightful opportunity to work on Charlie Brown's office. <laughs> this is the uh, Peanuts Worldwide headquarters, which is not too far from our office. Um, and it was a real delight being a, a Snoopy fan. I can say, you know, with authority that it was a, a real joy to get to work on a project like this. Uh, so, you know, we also do freestanding houses. I'm, I'm basically showing these to show you that we don't only do apartment renovations. Uh, we have a, a, a broad band of, of work, but this is a house we did in Jackson, Wyoming, incredibly detailed on an absolutely beautiful site that overlooks the Elk Refuge um, with these painterly American West uh, views. Um, but we also bring the level of detail that we do on these uh, apartment projects into the residential sphere of houses. Um, you know, very special place, this looking at this site. The porch became part of the living area because this is not a large house. The floor inside and outside are level. There's a little tiny drain here that takes the water away. So we don't have any pitch or weird cuts in our, our tile floor outside. And we defined all of the interior rooms um, except for the bedrooms that need privacy with these custom cabinets that were inspired by Charlotte Perriant. And uh, we had, again, really amazing craftsmen to help build and realize that, you know, we had mock-ups of these handles shipped from Wyoming to our office in New York, uh, just to make sure they were the right size, size and, and scale. This is another view showing one of these hardworking room dividing cabinets that, um, you know, there's actually power and data going into this cabinet. It's all sliding up through one of these custom fabricated metal legs. But again, just a, a quick snapshot of some of the other projects that we're not going to really go into today, but are part of our office and I'm, I'm proud to share. Um, so we think about every project as having success, success factors, regardless of the type. You know, we uh, work really hard to understand the site, uh, whether that's an apartment or a house in Wyoming. We're really careful with our palette selection in terms of materials. Um, we're very sensitive to the scale and the, the everything from scale, texture to durability. Um, we try to develop clear forms and uh, understand the, the scale of the project. Um, we insert a sense of order into projects that have sometimes been renovated so many times they've become rabbit warrens or, or just mess. Uh, so we try to try to bring a sense of order to these things. We celebrate material connections, you know, understanding how two elements come together is a big deal. Uh, overlaying the interior design, we always do real furniture plans from the start of a project. I mean, that from the very beginning, that becomes an important aspect, especially when the projects are small in scale. Um, we're very fortunate to have custom fabrication readily available so we can custom design most of the, the furniture or millwork elements that are going into our projects. And uh, I'll be candid, we have generous budgets. Um, our clients uh, are working very hard to, to make it look like the money that they're spending on the projects. And uh, by any standard, it's, 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 it's generous. Um, so to talk about building submarines in the sky um, or to subtitle that to go from small to smaller, 
Today, we're gonna to understand New York City apartments in general. Um, I'm gonna give you a sense of scale, talk about the typical construction types that we have, and also the fun um, concept of just getting in the door. Um, just getting into some of these places is a challenge. And I mean that literally and metaphorically. So here we have for scale five apartment plans that we have worked on in the office. And I hope they're, they're coming off clearly. They look okay on my screen. Um, you know, one of the smallest complete residential projects we've ever done was 300 square feet. Uh, and that was in the Greenwich Village. And one of the largest projects we've done uh, in the city is a Park Avenue combination where there were four apartments that were combined into one home for a family. And that is about 4,500 square feet. And so then we've had all sorts of shapes and sizes between that from a thousand square feet duplex, uh, an almost 3,000 square foot duplex, another uh, 2,200 square feet uh, on the, that's a gross square foot that netted out to 1,600 square feet. So this is just to give you a sense in your own work, because I think we have a lot of architects here and, and, and maybe even people who like real estate, <laughs> uh, understanding what a square footage is and what that looks like in comparison uh, means a lot. Um, so the first question that we uh, have to get into whenever we get a new project is, is what kind of building is this? And this is an example of a slab style building. It was built in 1984. Uh, so it's considered post-war. And it was unusual because this is uh, the top floor of the base and a base plus tower building. So there was a base and there was a tower on top of it. And so we were on the, the fourth floor here, but um, normally the slab apartments, the slab is the actual ceiling and there's no space above it. But the developer, when this was built, had some systems and some uh, ducts going through this apartment and they just made a single level ceiling out of it. So we kind of did the impossible in New York and we raised the ceiling. Uh, we don't get to do that very often, but we didn't raise it anywhere past the, the slab. Um, and this little detail shot sort of shows we have poke throughs for plumbing and some power. And those are usually unmovable in residential and commercial actually, we've had a lot of latitude in, in moving those, but in residential, this is sort of a, a big red X. You cannot poke through the slab, you cannot channel. Um, it's just a, a non-starter for any kind of building review. That project I was showing you was on the left, the before, and on the right, uh, the after. So we really opened this little place up, um, but that's because we knew what we were working with in terms of the, the parameters. So the structure were concrete posts, the floors were concrete slabs. These apartments have common uh, water risers and house lines. Um, the shutoffs and access panels always have to be accessible. So your design has to work around that. Electric risers and, and panels uh, are usually required to stay in their exact spot. We can't really move them. So as an example, this is where the gas range was in the real estate plan. And the gas line that is common to all of the units here is in this wall. And that's why this little bit of a wall had to extend um, past uh, the, the stove in this iteration because we had to keep that. Um, there were electric risers and panels, what was exhaust and venting. Those are often immovable and common and shared among apartments. Uh, in a slab building, in the newer buildings, they often have a common gas meter. So moving a gas line is a non-starter. And uh, the P-tax, which is the air conditioning, usually through the wall. And due to the complexity and the cost, we are rarely proposing new or enlarged openings in any of our projects. Um, so that's kind of a, a primer on the slab building. But as you can see, even with all of these sort of limits and constraints, we were able to make a, quite a difference in the planning of this small apartment. And I'm gonna get into that real quick. So this is just a before of that drop ceiling and an after where we were able to raise parts of the ceiling, but everywhere we have these beams dropped is some sort of building service that was running through. So in order to not have a kind of uh, crazy mess, we inserted these uh, beautiful wood beams to kind of unify the space and uh, help distribute the light by the reflections. It, it just turned out very nicely. The other thing is the, the clients were fantastic uh, and they let us ex you know, experiment and try things. So the standard bath plan did not work for them because they would have you know, 
themselves and some of their adult children perhaps staying in the apartment at the same time. And we could not add a second bathroom to this unit. So we created an alternate bath layout that allowed multiple occupants to use it at the same time. So we were able to rotate the, the water closet 90 degrees and um, use a, uh, in this case, we used an in-wall tank because we were able to connect the water back to the riser, which was in the side wall here. And that had a private door and was able to be completely shut off. We also turned the tub into a shower room that had wet and dry spaces. So you could shower and dry off again with some privacy. We created a wet vanity again, against the water wall, the wet space, and uh, we created a dry vanity so someone could brush their teeth and someone else could put on their makeup at the same time. And we increased the storage by getting extremely specific with their needs. So we knew where the sheets and the blankets and the towels are going versus the toilet paper and razors and everything else. The other thing that was important because bathrooms need um, ventilation is we tap the vent from the building into three separate areas to pull the air from the different spots. So we were able to achieve the requirements for ventilating the space by just creating a small tap line to each of the areas. And um, I'm pleased to say that, you know, again, these are some of our clients that have come back. They love the space very much. And uh, it was fun to have the latitude to get creative and make this happen. Um, so the, the next kind of construction type we work in very frequently is an ash fill, which is typically found in pre-war buildings, which are buildings that were built before World War II. There's often a lot more latitude to move the plumbing and the utilities due to the, the gap basically between the slab and the finished floor to run the, the lines. Uh, due to their age, the pre-wars are often larger than post-war apartments. This is, a, this is a very big apartment and the front door being here, this is going to an egress stair on the left. You know, we have a series of closets. There's a gallery. We created a dining room. There's a living room. There's a, a family room kind of den. But our main focus of work was here in the kitchen area. Um, so to zoom in there. So these are three plans of the exact same apartment uh, through the magic of a real estate website. You know, we have the access to the 1929 plan um, by Carpenter. And this is showing, you know, the service entrance that leads to a back stair, there was a laundry room, there was a shared bath, there was a staff room, and then there was an eat-in kitchen. And then originally there was a long hallway and butler's pantry that led to a dining room. Uh, when our client bought the apartment, it was in its 1978 version where there was a large scattered eat-in kitchen, an oddly shaped dining room, and then uh, the gallery and they had added the bath. And when we came along, we created this uh, contemporary kitchen with an island with uh, seating with a banquette. There was a desk uh, for working. There was a coffee station, uh, a much larger refrigerator. We incorporated two sinks, two dishwashers, and then we had a real laundry room. And because this apartment incorporated central air conditioning and um, power, we had uh, to create a utility closet that was right next to this window that was in the courtyard. So uh, quite a bit of ability to move the sinks which are here and here uh, and to here and there uh, based on the kind of construction technique. And here's a little example of what we're looking at and what I say ash fill. I, I mean ash fill. I, I mean there are sleepers that the finished floors sleep upon, um, but there's uh, basically ash filling the gap between the structure in there. So the plumbing lines in these kind of buildings were able to kind of wiggle and move around and get you know a shower drain in the middle of a new shower, but it's not without its its challenges. This is a steel structural element that needed to be refireproofed after the 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 plumbing was installed. Um, but it's it's messy, uh, and these beautiful New York City apartments they're built on ash. Uh, what else are we getting into? <laughs> so, you know, working in these buildings, the 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 pre-war buildings are often very underpowered. So we'll have a huge apartment like that with 60 amps of power. And then we'll be requested to put in central air conditioning, um, you know, a, a new washer dryer, um, induction cooktop, hood, microwaves, you know, all of the appliances that a contemporary family needs and we'll have 60 amps. So we'll need to run power up. And a lot of times the power will run up through a service hall or in the case of that last apartment, we ran it into uh, on the exterior of the building which this being a landmark district needed to go through a whole different layer of approvals along with everything else. In these older apartments, we'll often get gas meters in the building. So this is the live gas line uh, exposed and running through the whole building. And our meter 
was in the unit. Now this actually became a benefit because we were able to then uh, turn off the gas to the unit, run all new house lines through it and reconnect the, the meter. Um, that is something we cannot do in those slab buildings or those post wars because you're sharing a gas meter with all of your neighbors. And if they shut it down and turn it on and there's a leak, then the whole building will get shut down. And it's, um, you can read about it in the New York Times. It's, it's kind of a problem. So we typically don't get to work on moving gas appliances very much unless we have the meter in the unit. We also inherit decades of uh, work that has not always been done appropriately uh, and it's confusing. So this is what we call a plumbing knot. <laughs> and um, this was where that staff room was, but you'll see various shutoff valves, different types of gray tape. And these are the kind of things we uncover during demo. And the last thing is, it's, it's interesting for me to see always when we open up these buildings and we see the, the non-load bearing partition walls, we get, uh, you know, zip block, which is a very lightweight block material that was covered in plaster. But then we also get the conduit uh, from power. And sometimes the power uh, is feeding another apartment actually from this. So we have to be very careful when we open up and get into it. So again, I'm focusing on working in New York City and while, why it's different than working other places. And we know this from working in other places. So on the left is kind of an example of some of our plumbing work in the city uh, or the plumbing work we have to be responsible for. And it, you know, we have to have metal fireproof construction. All of our drain pipes and attachments, you know, it's part of a cast iron system. Uh, we have copper supply lines that have to be insulated. Uh, if we have a shower, it gets a lead pan. Uh, the shutoff valves uh, have to be you know, integrated into the plumbing. You can see those there. Uh, we have to do very specific items for sound isolation, waterproofing. We have to use BX metal encased cables. Uh, if we do any kind of network like ethernet, those have to be plenum rated. And sometimes we are working with union construction, which you know can put a 30% surcharge on the cost of a project, which is pretty substantial. On the right is a project we have uh, on Long Island where we have you know, wood studs, PVC uh, drains, uh, PEX plumbing fittings uh, with copper uh, attachments. We are using Romex wire, not the, the encased BX. And uh, we use fabric pans in the uh, showers. And we are very, very rarely have any union construction on a house in the country or in the suburbs. So that's kind of why the rent is so damn high. Uh, the, the materials uh, and, and bits and pieces are, are very expensive and they're shared with a number of people. Um, so what else is required or, or put into these projects? You know, we have to put uh, fireproof fire stop and draft stop and all of the penetrations through a slab. So that's what this red uh, material is doing. Uh, we have to waterproof any wet area, whether it's a kitchen, a bathroom, a laundry, uh, or even an HVAC closet. And that is usually a fabric membrane and a liquid applied together. And we can't put any water supplies in a floor. We have to either, if we're moving the water around, we have to uh, run them through walls or through newly dropped ceilings. And then on top of all of that, we are adding either five or 10 mil of soundproofing over a subfloor uh, to help make it uh, quieter for the neighbors and often for our uh, uh, clients. So again, I don't know if you can hear the, the car alarm that's going off below the office, but here we are. Um, so getting in the door, this is a, a not unusual sliver of space that our contractors have to bring all of the material to the project in and out from the street. I haven't even mentioned about parking, <laughs> um, but they're, they're bringing all the materials in and out of a project through something that looks similar to this, maybe a, at the most five foot hallway. And then they bring them downstairs, uh, usually down a flight of stairs into a service basement uh, where they'll go up either one of the residential elevators. If the building is newer, they don't usually have a, a, a separate service elevator. And then they have to bring protection to cover the walls and uh, floors. Uh, or they go through a service hall down the back. Regardless, these are all very small spaces to be bringing demolition debris and new materials and appliances and furniture uh, in and out of a project. So uh, we, again, we give enormous credit to our builders for, for making quite a bit of magic happen. Um, but we also have to know these parameters so that we can plan and understand uh, what we're designing and how it's going to be executed. Because if we had a great design that 
couldn't be achieved, then that would that would be just terribly disappointing. So a quick touch on our design process and working with clients. There are really two basic types. People who have built and renovated in New York, they understand what we're going through. They understand what they're gonna go through. And then there are types that haven't. And so there's some education that has to happen um, when it comes to like the process. And that's kind of what I'm giving you today in more detail than I give to clients. Um, with the ground rules, you know, everybody has to be patient. Even though a New York minute is seven seconds, uh, <laughs> things take time. And it's partly because of all the different hands, and different eyes and different parties um, brought in. There is no such thing as an easy project here. Anybody that tells me adamantly that their project is easy, uh, that's when the red flags come on. Uh, there's just no, we know, we've been doing this for 20 years, we're familiar. We make it easy, make it look easy, but it's it's actually quite a lot of work. The tools we use in our design process, I think are, are common to a lot of architects. We use analog uh, by hand drawing and sketching and digital with 3D models. We often do full-scale mock-ups. I think that's really important when we're looking at uh, things in a, in a certain scale. We do tons of material samples, and then we look at uh, precedent. So, you know, in working with clients, Oftentimes, you know, what we get versus what they want versus what we do. This is an actual photograph from a client's project. <laughs> uh, this is a, a, a co-op that they purchased. Uh, it was actually had been used as a obstetrician's office in a co-op building and had been abandoned for about 10 years. And this is what it looked like when we did our first site visit measuring. Uh, so, the point is the spaces are small, they're dark, they're in poor condition. Uh, oftentimes they'll have asbestos. Uh, and then, you know, the wish list involves something that looks something like this. So we're trying to figure out how do we bring in all of the natural light, the spacious feeling um, into uh, a really confined uh, and tight space. And this is the result of that particular project. So what we get versus what they want versus what we're able to do, you know, Something like this might not look too impressive if you're used to working on houses that have a driveway and, and all sorts of access, but uh, to get this amount of natural light and this amount of space and free, you know, this is something that we're, we're proud of. So a quick summary of the context and parameters, you know, we're working with client goals. Uh, before we can uh, get any kind of uh, city approvals, we have to get the building, the co-op or condo uh, board has to approve the project. We're oftentimes uh, running into uh, hazardous materials like asbestos. Uh, we have to remove that. And, and in the same time, we're getting landmarks review of the, the areas in a landmark district. Then we have a department of buildings review. So in New York City buildings, the work days are very short. They usually only allow work from nine o'clock to four o'clock and there's no weekend or holiday work. So there's nothing that can be done uh, on weekends or holidays. And the holidays are defined by the building. So a building might close from November 15th to January 15th, for example, uh, because they don't want any work happening during the holiday season. Uh, very small spaces, which means you have limited workers on site and they can only work in sequence. So they can't start on one thing, let somebody else work on that, move to another part of the apartment and then go back. It is just a, a, a sequence only kind of thing. You know, we're dealing with inspections. The contractors have to deal with traffic and parking with material removal and uh, delivery. You know, elevators are small spaces. So again, huge appliances and things are, are working there. You know, we have building staff to contend with. This is yet another layer of policing uh, on our projects and people who are um, interesting uh, to characters, let's say. Some of them have been in the buildings for a long time. Uh, we're dealing with fire safety and sprinklers. Um, something that adds to the stress of any of these projects is uh, whether or not somebody's doing a renovation on their apartment, they're still paying for the carrying costs. So uh, a co-op association fee is still continuing whether you live in the apartment or not. So there's some real anxiety and urgency to get a project moving and completed because we can't start any of the approvals until the property is under ownership. Um, again, we can't penetrate any of our demising walls or floors or ceilings. Uh, you know, neighbors in New York, you might've seen only murders in the building, the neighbor factor is a big deal. We have to take photos of people's apartments before we start so that they can't say that our contractor caused a crack in their ceiling that they haven't painted since 1974. And then, you know, we're just dealing with the common utility lines, as I mentioned, and a wet over dry. 
So that's kind of a lot <laughs> to deal with and to try to create a design and imagine something amazing and, and get there. I'm not complaining at all because um, it's what I'm used to, but it's, it's a lot to be aware of um, in terms of your context and parameters. So, you know, why do we do this? <laughs> why would anybody choose to, to jump in and do this? Well, the speed of the projects is very attractive. You know, Jacob mentioned uh, we worked together at Robert Stern's office and the first house I worked on, uh, I believe it was a five year project and that's a long time. Um, the speed of these projects is typically 12 to 18 months from when somebody calls us to when they're moving in. Uh, we really have exceptional clients. I mean, people come to us when they want something really special, they want something really unique. They uh, are, are ready to make you know kind of dreams happen and I, I really love that again we have relatively high budgets and and any architect knows that's simply more fun we get to detail all of the custom items again we have the great builders and craftspeople uh with high expectations and we've developed this skill set this is a skill set we know we're familiar with it um that doesn't mean there are unique challenges yet again on top of every project um and the other reason why i do this is I, again i Get to work with really talented people the the folks in my office and my partners they're they're a lot of fun to work with they're 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 smart and they make these difficult things uh, uh a lot more palatable and enjoyable so uh how do we make art out of residential architecture so this is just a kind of uh, an attempt at zoom humor with no laugh track or anything um, I was told by a friend of mine that I sent this to that this is also how seven and nine year old boys load dishwashers, but I, I you know, how do we, we merge creating something special out of these uh, kind of unique circumstances. So I'm going to show three uh, case studies of projects that we've done, um, and I hope you enjoy them. I'm going to show a little bit about the parameters and, and how we started off. So. The three case studies I'm going to show, one is on Thompson Street in the village, one is on East 16th Street, which is not far from our office, and the other was on Gramercy Park. So on Thompson Street, uh, we're, uh, you know, there are a lot of different kinds of living in New York. Some people don't stay very long. They'll be in New York for a small period and then go to another home. And so those pied de can be small. So uh, this program was to create a luxury apartment for brief stays, and it is 300 square feet. And designing 300 square feet, uh, it, it can be a lot of fun if you let it, when you understand that your precedent is uh, hotel rooms, boat cabins, private jets. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a unique scalar challenge. This is a picture of Thompson Street. The apartment is up here, but it also kind of illustrates how, you know, how wide the sidewalks are in the village that New York doesn't have alleys, the trash is left on the sidewalk for the sanitation to pick it up. And the parking, you know, this is one lane of traffic going through with parking on both sides. So anybody trying to make a delivery with material or appliances or furniture really has to, to do some planning there. Uh, this is the apartment that our clients bought. That's our real estate agent. Uh, so this is a very small space and it was poorly organized with stock units. Everything in there was kind of bought off the shelf. Uh, the materials were very low grade. There's no level ceiling or wall <laughs> or floors in the city. Uh, this place had very insufficient and, and bad lighting and the appliances were cheap. I mean, it's just, it, it was not a great spot. So we looked at the plan and, you know, we had to know that uh, form follows storage, uh, which is, you know, form follows function, form follows parking, form follows storage when we're dealing with small spaces in New York. And all the furniture here performs uh, multiple functions. Uh, so we did a mix of built-in elements and movable items, and we really concentrated on the materials and textures. So this is a photo of the after, uh, pretty much from the same spot. Um, so we considered the space as a whole, and we used the millwork both as function, uh, where there's a bench with storage below here on the left, and as, as a material with the wainscot on the right. So you know, lining up this ledge, and this little ledge on this uh, little tiny room makes a big impact uh, in the feel of the space and how it um, it doesn't feel, uh, there's a sense of order to it. Uh, we relocated the refrigerator and ganged it with the closets here on the right in the back. So it's still part of the kitchen in terms of function, um, but it's visually not disruptive uh, to the space. It's not a big metal box in the middle of a small room. Um, we integrated shelving uh, with uh, task and ambient lighting. So there's, you know, lighting kind of tucked in 
the shelf has a light that shines both up and down. And then we have the, the recessed lights and the drop ceiling here. Um, all the furnishings uh, are transformable. So this coffee table actually rises up and becomes a dining table for four. The love seat is also a sofa bed. And you know, we, oops, we had a limited material palette uh, with you know, a nice variety of scale and texture. So we have a suede, a suede feel wallpaper. Uh, we brought in these really great Paul Smith fabrics. Uh, and you know, there's a mixture of solid texture and, and pattern uh, that really complements the art and helps make the space feel cohesive and pleasant. So uh, back to what we were talking about with these parameters, you know, this water wall uh, here on the right. So we have a drain and riser stack that is not moving. Uh, the light blue is the definition of the wet area. So we couldn't put anything outside of the space, but the refrigerator by technical terms is not wet. It doesn't have an ice maker. So it was able to be grouped with the closets and still be part of that kitchen working triangle. Um, the electric panel is in green here, and that was an immovable element. And then we had the gas riser line, again, another immovable element. So we were kind of working with the, the guts of the building uh, in this very specific way. So, you know, it is a small apartment. We had to have a Murphy bed. <laughs> uh, and we integrated that. And one of the ways we made that not feel like a Murphy bed in the room was we brought in other pieces of furniture uh, that were of similar scale, of similar height, and that gave it some, some friends <laughs> and made it uh, a little more connected. Uh, we also ganged the window and the door and the radiator unit with a, a mirrored transom. Again, we didn't have the opportunity to poke through the front of this building, but we were able to to line up the furniture elements with this transom element, which created an ex, you know, expanse of the ceiling, which made the face space feel a little larger, but also just kept everything together uh, in partnership with the, the pieces that we put in. And then with the, the Murphy bed, so it didn't just feel like a mattress falling out of the wall, we brought in some charging uh, outlets for your, your phone. There's lockable storage in there in case guests are coming. There's reading sconces. These shelves are where the pillows are stored uh, in the meantime. And just this little element of the bench next to the bed uh, has a ledge. And so they you know, stumble upon art and they'll just put it up before it can be framed. It's, it's just a nice uh, domestic touch. So this is a very small space. You know, we kind of refer to these things as jackknives. Uh, they, they pull out, they <laughs> come together uh, and it's, it's a really small but elegantly furnished and appointed. Uh, apartment. So that's one of the smallest full-on projects that we've done, um, but it was enjoyable. And their art collection is, was really fun to work with too. So this next case study is uh, in uh, near Stuyvesant Square, which is just to the east of us near East 16th Street. And the um, we were rethinking the developer's decisions here. So this is a former parish house. It's in a landmark district. And the program was to make more usable space and light. This apartment did have the bonus of having outdoor space and exterior terrace. And it was about 1,200 gross square feet or 1,000 net square feet. And our precedents were really looking at apartments in Paris, uh, with a little bit of Ville le Duc. There, there, isn't, there aren't a lot of spaces like this in New York. So it was a real joy to work on it. And it was uh, really unique. So the developer cut through the uh, building in some really weird ways. So you couldn't really see out of the windows. The light was strange. There was a lot of, uh, kind of unusual decisions that when you're working on a whole building, you can understand. But when you get into each individual, individual unit, uh, seemed to not make sense. So this is a quick diagram of our before and after. So the original apartment on the left here had a bathroom that you went upstairs to this level and then you'd have to go down to the bathroom and then back up to the main bedroom. So it was a dark apartment. It was rather mean. When we did our demo, we exposed all this amazing steel work and we have skylights and clear stories that bathe the place in light. You also couldn't see out of the windows. They're very high on the floor. So we raised the platform up in the back and we put the bathroom and the, the bedroom all on one level. And so this is a very quick cutaway 3D axonometric view where here's the bedroom, the catwalk and the bathroom. I have to note that it from this bathroom is a skylight and you could brush your teeth and, and, and watch, uh, we just see the Empire State Building, which was kind of fun. But we divided the space into you know, a study, into a living space, 
to a kitchen. And, you know, the before on the left, you know, just very stock, low ceilings, high windows, dark. And when we opened it up, uh, it, it really just made a lot of sense. Uh, so seeing the, the skylight and the, the old structural metal, which we chose to keep exposed, uh, we raised a platform so we could tuck a powder room in the corner and you can also see out of the window. So we're solving for a lot of problems here. And then this is the after with the catwalk and the stairs. This staircase, you know, actually ended up working as a piece of furniture during parties. People treated it like a porch stoop and sit there and it has a couple of details. And we got to design some custom furniture for this house too. Some, some fun, bright uh, storage units. Uh, on the left, just a quick picture of the bedroom. On the, on the middle is the bathroom, again, with that great skylight kind of flooding the space and then the outdoor space, uh, uh, you know, with again, a little bit of enclosure carrying the blue color through. The stairs, you know, we detailed very carefully and had a uh, drawer. We actually added drawers to the stair risers. So we added some storage kind of in a hidden space. We had a weird corner, so we uh, put an appliance garage and, and used some good space. And we had a pull-out counter that extended some of the work surface in a, in a rather modest kitchen. Uh, and then from the catwalk, you can kind of peer down into the living room and you see the exposed steel, which is great. And we custom designed some rugs for the client too that are, uh, you know, they love the Brooklyn Bridge. So we made a really fun rug uh, on the left here and then just, took in some of their travels and favorite places and made kind of a whimsical, uh, enjoyable rug. It was a great project, really unique. And uh, we we're uh, proud of what we we're able to get done um, based on the, the, the typical <laughs> what you can get done. This last one is a really unique project. Uh, this is in the Gramercy building, which is on Gramercy Park. And it was the first residential co-op in New York City. So it's from 1883. Uh, the construction type is brick bearing wall with wood joists and the program was to create a one bedroom two bath apartment with a study we created a, a modern box within a traditional space and we wanted to keep as many of the original details as we could uh, the owner has an absolutely astounding back, uh, art and furnishing collection the furniture is art in this house it was really great and we coordinated craftsmen and vendors from california new york and france uh, basically we had one color of wood stain that was supposed to be applied to anything, whether it was coming from overseas, if it was being installed here, uh, or if it was coming from California. So we were doing a lot of comparisons and, and sharing formulas. Other units in this line um, have up to three bedrooms. So making a one bedroom apartment out of a three bedroom apartment sounds kind of uh, counterintuitive, but it really uh, afforded uh, a unique plan. And we had to repair decades, if not centuries of damage and poorly done renovations inside this unit. So this is the building. It's, you know, it's fantastic. They describe it as Queen Anne. Um, it, when you walk through the, the portico between the front door and the portico is this beautiful stained glass sleigh light. And then Gramercy Park is kind of where those trees are where I'm pointing with my cursor. But our apartment is here on the south and east side of the building. It's in the, it's in the back of the building. Um, it's interesting to note, so this side of the building doesn't have many windows on it, and it didn't have a window on this side of the bay. And that's because when it was built, the Third Avenue L, pictured here at 23rd Street, was very noisy, very loud. And so this side of the building got very limited light. It's astounding to us how much light comes in this building from this south facing light shaft, these angled walls, uh, pour light in at certain times of the year. But this was the 1990 renovation that we inherited with the kitchen kind of moved from the core out to the, the outside wall. Um, and again, just lots of little rooms. Uh, our design really opened it up and created uh, this kind of loft-like environment out of an older traditional style apartment. We improved the appearance of the fireplaces with small fireboxes. The original mantles were no longer in the house. Uh, we aligned all the windows through interior trim details. So these windows that have been added over decades, if not centuries, after the Third Avenue rail was taken away, uh, we regularized the head heights of those using our interior details. Uh, we had to, had to, uh, we got to incorporate some original Jean Prouvé modular building panels into the design as room dividers. And we brought in clear story lights to the interior walls to let light come in from the east into the, the kind of darker core of the house. And so we also brought in a non-traditional kitchen as part of the living space. 
So a quick glance at our palette. So this is the Jean Prouvé uh, school in Cameroon, um, one of the many that he did. And we had one of these, we had two of these panels, which you'll see. We used Fornicetti tiles and some Geoponte hardware. Uh, so we got to work with some really good designers on this. Um, the joists, you know, this is a wood joist. We had wet areas that we, could, we couldn't expand through the wet areas, but we didn't want to have curbs or saddles. So we expanded the waterproofing uh, in a larger zone to satisfy the building requirement because we didn't want to have any curbs and saddles. We wanted continuous floors. Uh, even though the old kitchen was in a completely different space and we weren't making it a wet space, um, these were our wet walls and our electric riser. And those will come up in a second. Um, I know I'm going a little bit long and I appreciate your patience. I'm gonna just buzz through it. Uh, so the before is here on the left. It was you know, a very pleasant, but not very interesting uh, apartment. And on the right is uh, some of the work we did. You can see we lined up the, the windows. We have shade pockets and our, our, our controls for things like fireplaces and AV are hidden in these little panels. And we expanded these small fireboxes using slab stone, again, with the client's absolutely stunning art and our uh, furniture collection. Here in the master bedroom, we expanded the wall. Instead of having like three weird windows on the back wall, we put a, a continuous drape and we made a, a, a piece of furniture very custom inspired by Florence Knoll cabinetry that is floating on the uh, off the floor. Uh, and uh, again, just made a pretty and unique space. So there was quite a bit of engineering getting into making a a 17 foot long knoll inspired cabinet to hover. But again, everything's doing work. We have uh, blanket storage in the headboard with these top uh, lids that flap open. The nightstands turn down uh, here and here. And then we have additional like storage for the master bedroom. And this is the quick uh, model to sort of show where you have these irregular windows. We just did a draped wall, which turned out very nice. Just a quick shot of some of the progress. And this is what the project looked like during the, the building. We did mock-ups of the floors to get the sizing of the planks right. We were able to, you'll see in a minute, our Fornicetti tiles, we were able to mock up and lay out and choose where each one went. Uh, this is showing some of that wood construction that we ran into. You'll note that the, 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 the wood beams are not regularly sized or spaced, and some of them were broken and cracked in substantial ways, which uh, we had to repair and we brought in steel. Uh, also, again, fireproofing uh, with these acoustically isolated drop ceilings and then the heavy duty waterproofing, basically putting a swimming pool um, in the apartment. And so all of that is kind of going into what's below this, <laughs> which I think, you know, it, it doesn't really indicate. And that was part of the emphasis of my talk is that I wanted to show what goes into a very beautiful finished work. It's not just a, a simple reclad or redressing. Um, those Jean Prouvé panels uh, ended up being a room divider between the kitchen and the study, but they also helped separate the private areas of the house, the bedrooms from the public areas. And so these were uh, framed as you know, objects of art that they are. One is fixed and one is uh, mobile. Uh, it slides back and forth on a track. We had uh, you know, very careful drawings to help understand and elevation and detail. You know, we had a vent that we couldn't get around. We had to drop our track below that. Uh, we separated everything with little reveals. So this is the fixed panel section and this is the operable panel section. And these are some 3Ds of how it was all supposed to together, go together. And we, we got to be there for the uncrating. Um, we just happened to be on a different job site in California when these arrived from overseas. But it's a really great view of the kind of exceptional detailing in the aluminum and the corrugation and, and the quality of light uh, that they kind of reflect. And so this is just another view of those in place. And they lead to this little tiny study that's behind. And we put in an original George Nelson CSS system, which having watched them install it after we sourced all the different pieces is one of the most difficult pieces of furniture I've ever seen put together. But we have the clear story light above that lets the light in from the east. And then opposite this system, we have our custom millwork with a hidden TV that rises, but up above are all of our Lutron and home control panels uh, kind of hidden, I think, hopefully elegantly in this, this piece of cabinetry. Um, again, some other pictures of that uh, kind of funky 
uh, interior uh, entry hall, which we made into a gallery for the client's photography. And we also just had these little doors that we ganged together with solid panels to make something more than they just having a bunch of doors. Uh, the clear story light here, this is the east where the light comes in, and that's actually allowing some light to bounce into the bathrooms. And then these are some more, uh, diff these are different ways we created partitions in that loft-like space. And then a quick snapshot of the bathrooms. Again, this is the guest bath and the main bath. So we got to do slab work. The custom Fornicetti tiles are, are here on the floor looking wonderful. And every piece of millwork was custom designed and fabricated. We even went to the extent of dropping the ceilings and recessing the hardware uh, for the glass. So it recessed into the wall and to the ceiling. So we didn't have clips or channels. So it's quite a bit of uh, effort and detail. And then the last thing on this project was getting this 11 foot six Geoponte wall unit into the apartment when this is the service elevator and there was no way it was gonna make any of these turns. So the longest nine minutes of my life were watching this incredibly valuable piece of furniture go up in a little crate and get tipped in and dumped into a window uh, on the fifth floor of this building. <laughs> so that was kind of a heartbreaking uh, thing. No, it wasn't heartbreaking. It was exciting, but it was stressful. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, and then this is just a very quick three-dimensional image of the whole house together with the entry corridor, the living kitchen, the sliding panels with the uh, that kind of defined the modern box and the core with then all of the uh, living space around it. So, you know, we have a lot of fun with the results. It's a hard path to get there, but our clients stick with us and we really appreciate it. We've been lucky to be published quite a bit, and I know I've run long, so I'll just land here on the summary. Heather, you asked me to let you know when my last slide was, and this is it. So if everybody's awake. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, it, it's just, we've never had such a presentation with space and infrastructure constraints, and you just manage these so beautifully. It's really... Uh, oh, exciting to see. Uh, you do have some questions. If you have a few moments, we can uh, go through some of these. Sure, I'm happy to. We um, do uh, have a, a question from Karen. She asks, are you inspired the minute you walk into a space or do you need more information about the property and the people? Uh, that's a great question. Um, Sometimes I, the answer is sometimes. I think there are some spaces where you can really see something special is possible here, uh, and there are others when it's it's it, it's maybe more of a cookie cutter apartment, and you really need the feedback and you really need that sort of uh, conversation to happen. And and we love that. I mean, that's one of the fun things about our projects. We get close to the clients and and really get to have some intense conversations about what they're looking for and what we can help them make. Most of your work in Manhattan, Tom, or is it in the boroughs as well? Most of our work is in Manhattan, but we have worked in Queens and Brooklyn. Sure. You know, going back to the Asheville construction, we have a question about whether the ash presents any health hazards at all? Um, it doesn't. We have to have asbestos testing done uh, and lead testing done on projects, um, and the ash has not caused a problem. We have other health problems that we have to have uh, abated and managed before we can start building, but the ash has not. It's always sealed up before we're done. So you're not stepping on a floor and having a cloud of dust, you know, mm -hmm. freak out from corners. Um, one question here asking, do you typically have the luxury of improving multiple units on the same floor or do you frequently improve individual units while neighboring units on the same floor are occupied? You did address this a little bit, I think. Yep, I mean, unless we're combining the units together to create one apartment, we typically only are doing one at a time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they are occupied. And there is a very strict tenant protection plan system in New York City that we have to apply for, get approved and post before construction can, can start. And that's, we're working with the contractors um, for that. I didn't mention anything about insurance through all of this, but mm. <laughs> it's a big it's a very big part of, of getting in the door. Actually, there was a question about that, about whether, um, who typically provides builder's risk insurance is the question. 
Well, the, the buildings all set their own limits for requirements and, uh, but clients are able to buy builder's risk on their own uh, to supplement. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have to walk away from a project because you couldn't meet current code? No. I mean, there, there, are, there are challenges. Uh, you know, you can't expand a bathroom from a 1929 apartment six inches. You'd have to expand it over two feet to make it, you know, meet code. So that, that is sometimes a, a binary. Now we can redress the bathroom with new tile and, and fix the, the fittings, but we cannot like make a little increment. We'll have to make a big change there. And that's not always possible. If you have a 12 by 15 bathroom or a 12 by 15 bedroom with a small bathroom next to it, to increase the size of the bathroom means the bedroom would be unusable or there's some other structural or reason you can't do it. Wet over dry, for example, <laughs> they won't let you do it. Nothing's easy. Uh, what are the key differences between a condo and a co-op? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm only an architect, but uh, in real estate terms, a condo, you actually own the space, uh, you, you own the property and they have their own lot and tax numbers. Whereas a co-op, you're, you're buying shares in a corporation and they're leasing space back to you. So um, oftentimes the co-op boards are more strict with their rules than condos. Um, co-ops are usually less expensive to purchase but have a higher carrying cost. Um, I live in a condo, but we work in both condos and co-ops. Oh, very good. And actually the same person who asked that question said, fascinating and educational as a condo owner myself. Yes, you're giving all of us who live in small spaces in Madison, good ideas here. Um, many compliments. Uh, a question here, do building codes require thermal insulation upgrades to external walls and roofs? Um, Yes, quite simply, yes. And, and where does that impact things? Um, that impacts things when you're dealing with a small space already and you're asking somebody to give up six more inches of uh, floor area for insulation. That, that, that becomes a conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another kind of in infrastructure code question, are the residential units uh, typically with sprinklers? Um, frequently they're not. Uh, it's under something called fireproof construction, mm -hmm. where the corridors and the staircases might be sprinklered, but the units themselves are not. And so, you know, the front doors have to be rated for 90 minutes. And that's why we can't poke through the floors uh, or the, the walls, the demising walls. We have to maintain our fire rating between each unit so that it limits the spread of any of danger between units. Um, it's, it's a challenge, it's scary. It's, you know, you're up high in the air. Uh, and we've seen some videos recently of, of, of fires and buildings that haven't been um, properly built and maintained. And then you have some real tough stuff to watch. Yeah. Do you have the luxury of working with the same craftspeople on multiple projects? Uh, yes. Um, the builders usually bring their uh, subcontractors, which includes millwork. Uh, uh, but we have the luxury of working with those same builders over and over again because they uh, do great work and it's hard to find people you trust and build a community, kind of a professional community. And then we have all the folks that uh, we will bring in like drapery or upholsters and uh, they're able to, to keep working with us. They, we, when you get to know people, you have shorthands uh, and you kind of know what you're looking for and it's, it's fun and, and the best consultants and, and people we work with are those that we learn from. They're always happy to explain something else in more detail and we'll say, well, what about this? And they'll be like, well, yeah, how about we do that? <laughs> and it just kind of, it feeds on, on each other. Uh, so that's, it's great to have optimistic can-do people around you. Uh, given what I've said, all the, all the hurdles that we go over, it's pretty easy to be like, nah, I'm just gonna paint it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> question about, the question is, does the coffee table serve as the dining area? And I think that was your second project. And, and you, I think, said that it raised up into a dining oh, area. Oh, yeah, that was a really clever piece of furniture. I did not design, I bought, um, but it, it 
it's like a, it like has hydraulics and it's very seamless just rises right up to be a dining table or it comes right back down to be a coffee table it's, it's a really nice piece fantastic so as many questions as i'm giving you tom there are just as many people saying beautiful work thank you oh. for the presentation so can i get a transcript of this <laughs> yeah, actually, actually you can. zoom is Zoom has wonderful tools and I can send you a report of all of these comments. Um, this might be a nice one to go out on. This is Joshua Siddle who says, hello, Thomas, former classmate here. As a fellow practicing architect, we, pre we frequently run into unforeseen during construction. Can you talk about some of your more interesting or unusual unforeseen issues and how you dealt with them? <laughs> yes. I think because everybody knows what a change order is. <laughs> and, and that's unfortunate. I think one of the most interesting was we were combining apartments in an old townhouse that had been one family house and divided up into seven apartments. And we were putting back uh, four of the units into one apartment. And we were planning a staircase to go you know, right in the middle to kind of create this light well to be this wonderful cohesive thing that brought it together. And literally through it all was an arabesque of gas lines uh, from several centuries right where it needed to be. And the whole building would need to basically be repiped to, to make this happen. And, um, you know, because it's a co-op and it's a small corporation, when your client is the president of the board, they get to, to make that presentation and uh, they proceeded. And so we were able to continue with the project, but it, not without quite a bit of duress and uh, strategy uh, from different angles and approaches uh not just from a like well move the pipe well that's <laughs> of course that's that's the, the gordian knot cut right to move the pipe but getting all these different parties to come together and figure out how when why to to move that pipe um you know the building was due for a big repair and upgrade and that they they put it together as that and so fortunately it, it worked out well in the end for everybody but hi josh good to hear from you <laughs> can i just make one comment at the end here uh, I just want to say thanks, Tom. It, you've explained in great detail and beautifully to a very great degree what I think all architecture is about, which is threading the needle with all these constraints and still coming up with something that is greater than the parts you put together into it. So thank you. Thanks, Jacob. That's a beautiful summary. <laughs> beautiful. I, didn't, I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's so beautiful. I'm just going to say, uh, ditto that. <laughs> that was terrific. And um, Tom, thank you so much. And Jacob, thanks so much to the sponsorship of AIA Wisconsin. As I mentioned earlier, we have two more presentations by really interesting architects. And um, there's more information coming your way soon on those. Audience, thank you for being with us today. This was really a unique presentation for us and really delightful. So thanks, everyone. Have a great spring. Thank you. Yes. Get out and enjoy the weather if you're local.